Grand Portage Resources recently completed the 2018 drill program on its 100% controlled Herbert Gold Discovery property located in the prolific Juneau Belt in southeast Alaska. Drill results are expected through late 2018. Past drill results included numerous multi-ounce gold assays on multiple veins. Grand Portage trading symbols are GPG on the TSX Venture, GPTRF on the OTCQB, and GPB on Frankfurt. For more information, please visit our website, grandportage.com. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio, available online at talkdigitalnetwork.com. Welcome to HowStreet.com Radio, the online source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Steve Soretsky, a Vancouver-based realtor, online at stevesoretsky.com. Welcome back to the show, Steve. Thanks for having me on. Always a pleasure. Steve, a survey just came out with 46% of Canadians feeling they're just $200 a month away from insolvency. How does that affect the people in the real estate market? Um, I think it's obviously concerning when when home prices are as expensive as they are and you have rising interest payments. I think interest payments year over year, I believe, in Canada are up something like 11%. And then you have incomes, uh, wage growth now growing at 1.49%. Uh, so I think it's... Uh, creating a debt servicing problem uh, here in Canada. So I think that's something to watch for in 2019, and we'll have to see the direction that interest rates go up. See, right now it looks like the Bank of Canada is on pause, and, and my, my sense is they probably won't get much further, uh, if at all. Well, it wouldn't take much to make your household uh, expenses $200 more a month, would it? Yeah, no, it doesn't take much. It could just be, uh, you know, who knows? Increase in strata fee, maybe a special levy in there, and then all of a sudden you're in some in some financial hardship. So uh, it's really you know you don't really feel it too much as long as house prices are going up and you can continuously you know refinance your debt and pay off other debts, etc. But uh, it definitely becomes an issue if home prices, you know, as we're seeing, starting to decline. Um, you know, your ability to to refinance debt uh, becomes almost impossible. Does human psychology react differently to real estate markets versus the stock markets? Uh, there's been studies actually um, that show there's you know there's a wealth effect not only in the stock market but in real estate, but it's actually heightened uh, more so in real estate. Um, I think part of that might be because you have you know in Canada I think it's 69 percent home ownership rates you have a lot more people invested into into real estate and, and your ability to tap into equity uh, is you know much more likely than someone's gonna not really as likely to tap into say an RRSP um, so yeah I think that's part of the reason that there's definitely a huge wealth effect in, into real estate and that drives a lot of the consumer spending and spin-off uh, from from rising home prices have the lowest interest rates in almost a century had an effect on real estate market psychology? Yeah, I think it's there's there's been a lot of discussion about this in, in the finance space, uh, some really smart people. I think it's just created a lot of complacency amongst people. Uh, you know that the you know the central banks are going to always have your back, and you know as soon as interest rates get too high and people start to you know wobble, that the central bank will come in and, and save the day and. And, uh, you know, it's interesting as you look at Japan, I mean, they've been at basically, you know, zero interest rates for nearly two decades now. Uh, so I think, you know, once you, once you get there, you can actually get trapped, um, at the zero, at the zero bounce. And so, um, I think that's something that the central banks are, I think they've cornered themselves into a really tough position. And, and yeah, it does create a lot of complacency, uh, amongst the general, general public. A few years ago, we saw people lined up around the block to buy into condo developments. Was the fear of missing out a big factor in the real estate market run-up? Oh, for sure. Uh, you know, 20, 2015, 2016, and even for the condo market in 2017, it was propelled by multiple offers. I mean, at the peak, we were seeing detached homes getting 10 offers on them. There was news headlines circulating about the West Fan or East Fan home that was, you know, sold for a million dollars over the asking price. And, and, you know, a lot of people were basically reading those headlines and saying, oh, wow, you know, home, condo home prices up 30% year over year. And so that was driving a lot of the psychology. I think when you put this, you know, that over the heads of people that, you know, you might lose your shelter, 
when prices are rising two or three percent a month, you know, shelter, having a roof over your head is a basic human need. So I think when that's under threat or in jeopardy, um, I think it's, it makes perfect sense for, for people to sort of panic and, and pay, you know, maybe well over their budget or get into these bidding wars because, like, again, their shelter is under threat. So that was really driving a lot of it. We saw people lining up for pre-sales, tenting overnight, et cetera. Um, everybody just thought it was just going to keep rising and, and it was easy money to be made. And, uh, again, as we've seen with – as home prices have stopped rising – um, it's pulled a lot of that speculation and that fear of missing out uh, away and out of the market. Was it also a factor that perhaps everybody who wanted to buy did buy, and right now there isn't a lot of demand because most of the buyers already bought? I think that definitely a lot of demand gets pulled forward. Um, I can speak specifically to cases, you know, speaking with clients or, you know, other realtors' clients is – a lot of them were moving purchases forward, like buying units for their kids who may only be 10 years old or 13 or 14 years old, basically trying to secure their future because they see the prices rising exponentially. It's kind of like a, hey, we need to pull the trigger now if Johnny ever wants to live in the city. So let's buy him the condo now while he's 14 and we'll just rent it out until he's, you know, turns 20 and he's ready to move in. So uh, I think it definitely pulled some demand forward. And I think that's part of the reason why we're now seeing uh, an 18 year loan home sale. We'll have more with Steve Soretsky right after this. Hi, I'm Douglas Mason, President and CEO of Magnum Gold Corp, MGI and the TSX Venture Exchange. A 2015 drill program on the LH property intersected several high-grade gold intersections, including 11 meters of 20.66 grams per ton gold. Additional drill targets on the LH property have been identified by a 2018 drone airborne magnetic survey to further evaluate a pyrotite enriched gold bearing system. Please visit our website at magnumgoldcorp.com. MGX Minerals is revolutionizing the new energy economy with patented lithium extraction technology replacing traditional solar evaporation using low-cost, low-energy nanofiltration. The first system of this paradigm shift technology is currently being commissioned. MGX Minerals trades on the CSE, symbol XMG, the OTCQB, symbol MGXMF, and Frankfurt, symbol 1MG. For more information, visit our website, mgxminerals.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Steve Soretsky. Steve, is the fear of losing property value in a down market stronger than the fear of missing out? Uh, it's, studies show that it's not. There's actually, um, I can't remember the word for it, but uh, I was actually just reading this yesterday, where basically you'll actually see that people hang on to a losing bet. So they're much more inclined to sell as they've made a big gain, as opposed to when they have actually have a loss. They'll actually, they'll actually hold on to that longer, hoping that it sort of comes back and they can, you know, make their money back. Uh, and so I think that's part of what we're seeing now a little bit in terms of, um, quite frequently we're seeing in, in the new construction single family space, you know, a, a, a home builder would have bought a piece of land last year. They built this home on it and now, you know, they're trying to basically break even or make some money. But clearly, in order to sell, the home actually needs to sell at a loss, and, and you know they don't want to take a loss because they've just invested a year of their time, put a whole bunch of capital up front, and, and now they're faced with the reality that they're actually going to lose money. So what we're seeing is they're basically trying to hold that line um, and, and in the hopes that the market will rebound. And, and whether or not that's the case, we'll have to, to wait and see. In Vancouver, have people who have held on to the real estate for a long time ever lost money? <laughs> uh, I mean, I'm sure there's people have, have been, you know, that have lost money. It just depends on when you sell and and the circumstances. But I mean, obviously, we're in Vancouver. We've been in pretty much a 20 year bull market, so it's been a very tough one to bet against. Um, and, you know, I know a lot of smart people that I think their arguments make sense. Uh, that certainly, you know, even the Bank of Canada has come out and said that housing here is quite significantly overvalued. But uh, it just seems to continuously go up despite those remarks. And so um, I think it's 
created a, a mentality or ingrained a mindset that real estate prices here can't drop, which of course is, is a dangerous thought. Uh, but again, it's, it's a tough one to bet against because for 20 years it's uh, just consistently gone up. What happens to human psychology when a real estate market reaches capitulation? Uh, that's generally when we start to see basically people just saying, hey, just get me out of here. Uh, like, I just need to get out. That's sort of the idea behind capitulation. It's just uh, there basically is no liquidity. Uh, prices are accelerating quickly to the downside, and um, people basically just sort of lose hope in, in, in prices ever recovering. Um, and that's generally one of the last legs down before you kind of hit bottom and, and things start to recover again. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of the, the idea behind the capitulation, which I don't think we're at here in Vancouver. Uh, as I've talked about before, we have inventory building up, uh, but it's more so a result of really no sales. Um, it's not from like a flood of new listings and people panicking to sell, uh, but certainly it'll be something to watch moving forward. We'll have more with Steve Soretsky right after this. I'm Kelly Jennings, CEO of PowerVan Solutions. PowerVan is a cloud-based provider of auction, inventory, and finance solutions that make buying, selling, and financing vehicles more efficient. PowerVan Solutions trades on the TSX Venture Exchange symbol PBX and on the OTCQB symbol PWWBF and on Frankfurt symbol 1ZV. For more information, please visit us at PowerBandSolutions.com. Don't miss out. Stay informed. Receive the HowStreet.com weekly recap with thought-provoking podcasts, radio, and articles delivered to your inbox. Sign up for the HowStreet.com weekly recap on our homepage at HowStreet.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Steve Soretsky. Steve, can real estate market psychology be swayed by just word of mouth? Yeah, there's, uh, I think that was part of the, you know, what drove it, uh, in, in during the frenzy was the word of mouth. I mean, if you went to similar to Bitcoin, you know, if you went to a family dinner or a party, you know, the only thing people were talking about was Vancouver real estate and how much it was going up and how much people were making. And I think that really starts to spread and you can see it uh, throughout the media. I mean, I was going on radio interviews on a daily basis. People asked me to comment on the market because it was like every day there was something to talk about. The market was just going crazy. It was all anybody could think about, talk about. You go to a coffee shop, it's all you hear. Um, and I think that that same sort of psychology and word of mouth, I think, plays equally to the downside where uh, you'll start to see sort of more negative news headlines. Uh, you know, I'm sure you'll see people servicing that, hey, I just lost money on my pre-sale, like don't buy a pre-sale or whatever the case is. So I think, you know, word of mouth and psychology works both on the upside and the downside. What is behavioral economics and how does it affect real estate? Uh, it's just a different way, I guess, of viewing economics. So generally most mainstream uh, economists just look at something and they put it into their models and they assume that people act rationally. Um, they, you know, they assume that people are doing their calculations and just com being completely rational. But behavior economics basically is a different train of thought saying that human emotion and human sentiment is a huge component of driving uh, asset prices um, and particular real estate. Um, you know, as we can see, when people are making 10 offers on a home and, and paying a million dollars over asking, you could probably argue that's maybe not a rational behavior. A lot of that, again, is comes back to the fear of missing out. So that's a behavioral aspect, and that's kind of what uh, behavioral economics is. Well, I, I think of phenomena like the Cabbage Patch Kids or people have to have the hottest sneakers right now. You yeah, know, I mean, uh, you can look at, like, Bitcoin. I mean, that was a huge... Uh, mania that we were in, that we were in every day on the news. You're talking about Bitcoin and all these new coins and crypto millionaires. And, and it goes back to the, you know, back in the 1600s, I think it was the tulip mania where people were <laughs> buying and selling and trading each other tulips and they had a futures market for tulips. And, uh, you know, eventually that crashed. But it's, again, it's all, it's all human psychology and, and sentiment. When did real estate become an investment instead of just a home? 
I think people might differ or differentiate on this, have different opinions, but I think uh, it really became more of a financialized asset. Uh, I believe it was in the 80s when they started creating, uh, you know, they started syndicating mortgages uh, through mortgage-backed securities and basically pooling them and, and, you know, selling them off to investors. So basically it allowed the banks to increase their lending, uh, basically created another channel. So I think that's when you really started to see, uh, I think, the securitization of real estate, which I think helped to propel, uh, in my opinion, uh, what a home was viewed at. And that's why, like, I mean, back in those days, you'd see banks were only lending at, you know, 3x your income. Uh, whereas now, like in Vancouver, uh, maybe not at the stress test, but it's, uh, in the frenzy, I mean, people were lending up to 7x your income, right? So it's no question that if you're going to increase somebody's leverage, uh, it shouldn't be a surprise that home prices have risen as much as they have. I mean, you're lending, if you're lending seven extra income versus three extra income, of course the whole price is going to be higher. Do human psychology and behavioral economics combine to explain why people do what they do? Yeah, I think it's a huge proponent behind, uh, behind the rise and demise of asset prices. I think it's a sort of a self-fulfilling promise, prophecy. If you have positive, uh, consumer sentiment. People believe that prices are going to rise. They're happy to pay uh, an ever higher price for that asset. And I think similarly to the downside, if people believe prices are going to fall uh, or that they'll be cheaper in the years and months ahead. And generally people delay their purchasing decision waiting for things to, to drop. And I think that's again, kind of where we're at right now is people are have moved to the sidelines. Um, people are hesitant to pull the trigger because people do believe that uh, there's a decent likelihood that prices will be lower um, in the months ahead. With 45,000 or so people a year moving into the lower mainland, is that going to continue to put pressure on rising prices? Is there a way for prices to come down when you have that kind of population pressure? I think it's, an, it's uh, a long-term bullish argument to be made for Vancouver. I, I think that the net is actually around 30,000. That's generally historically what we have is 30,000. Okay. Um, so, yeah, I would say that, that, you know, in the long run, that's probably a positive and bullish argument, no doubt, for Vancouver, uh, people moving to the metro city. But um, part of the migration flows also depend on the strength of the economy. Uh, I would say that Vancouver and BC uh, as well as a province, a lot of our economic growth, our, you know, low unemployment, our, you know, strong GDP across Canada is because we have this housing and construction boom. And so it will be interesting to see as we're starting to see housing start to slow down the construction sector, real estate start to slow down the impact that may have on uh, our economy, our GDP, and as well as migration flows, right? So you get people moving here, looking for jobs, a lot of them become employed in the booming construction and real estate sector. So um, I think that's it's sort of a, they, they really do go hand in hand. So you have to kind of look at the big picture. Steve, thank you so much for chatting with us. Yeah, no worries. Thanks for having me on. My guest has been Steve Soretsky, Vancouver-based realtor, online at stevesoretsky.com. If you have any questions for Steve or any of our other guests, you can send them to info at howstreet.com. I'm Jim Goddard. Thanks for listening. Comments made on HowStreet.com radio are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any matter whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. HowStreet.com radio is a production of HowStreet Media Incorporated.